You have two handouts today because I couldn't think of much more to say about the doctrine of man than what's on the handout. And we could probably get through that in about 10 minutes unless there's a lot of questions. And personally, I find it difficult talking about the doctrine of man without going almost immediately into the doctrine of sin because man was without sin in the Bible in the first two chapters of Genesis. And by the end of the third chapter, he had fallen. And for the rest of the Bible, with the only exception being the 33 years that the Lord Jesus walked the earth, <laughs> there hasn't been a sin-free man since then, before or since. And so we cannot really discuss the human condition unless we talk about the problem of sin. That's my perspective. Uh, some years ago, I had to take a fairly intense theological exam in order to uh, be a certified biblical counselor. And I was reviewing that exam the other day to see if I could find some more information on the doctrine of man. And... Uh, the very first question under the doctrine of man was, how would you describe man's problem? <laughs> He's uh, fallen, thoroughly corrupt, totally depraved, absolutely hopeless and helpless without a savior. That's our situation. So we'll get started. The four major divisions of the doctrine of man are origin, nature, distinctiveness, and destiny. And basically, origin, man was created, perfect, without sin, and the Bible says in several places, in the image of God. It says it twice in the creation story in Genesis 1, but um, James also mentions it in his letter that man was created in the image of God. How do you bless God with your mouth and curse man who is created in his image? He's actually talking about the sinful way we use our tongue. But that his point is, you know, how do you speak blessings to God and then turn around and curse the one that God has created in his image? Anyway, he's reinforcing that man was created in the image of God. So... Yes, nothing catches God by surprise. One of my favorite sayings is, one thing you never hear God say is, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> and, and what you just said, Sandy, is something that has to do with sin and in Psalm 51, David sings, In sin did my mother conceive me. It doesn't mean that his mother was sinning, and that's the way he got conceived. I mean, but it does mean that from the very moment he was conceived, he was already a sinner because we're all born with the stain of original sin. We all come into this life bearing the burden of Adam's sin. We are corrupt from the moment we are born. Did anybody, um, why, did he, why did he bother to do all this? Because if he, he loves us. It's gonna be a mess up. Well, is he testing us all? Uh, they say he's probably testing them. 
God's motives for creating us are never really explained in Scripture. It isn't like God needed us. It wasn't because he was lonely without us. God is completely independent, self-sufficient, eternal, and all-powerful. He created us because he wanted to. Well, the, uh, he probably had plenty already doing that. Did he have a boatload of angels doing that? Yeah, God had angels. He wanted to create us in his image so that we could relate to him and, yeah. and know him. But now, the Westminster himself. Confession is what is quoted in the first uh uh, line of uh, this number one origin, man's purpose is to know God and enjoy him forever. That's a quotation from the Westminster Confession. So that's our purpose. Let's go ahead and just put it out here. Man was created in perfect fellowship and harmony with God in his image. And that, of course, again, is found in Genesis chapter 1. This does not mean physical likeness, for God does not have a physical body. No one has ever seen God. But it does mean in the mental, emotional, and spiritual likeness of God. God is a thinking being, man is a thinking creation. Man is, uh, God has freedom, man has freedom. God experiences emotions, men experience emotions. And by man, I'm speaking generically, of course, we're talking about men and women also. God is spirit and man has a spirit and a, a spiritual nature as well as a soulish nature and a physical nature. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Well, it's the next one, nature. Man has a spiritual as well as a physical dimension. Man is spiritual as well as physical. Man's earthly physical body is destined to die the moment he is born. The process is set in motion for him to die. His spirit, however, lives forever transcends his physical limitations. After a man dies, he receives a new body that lives forever. Does anybody have any questions about that? Do you all understand the nature of the resurrection body? No. This physical body, huh? Not really. Okay. The Jews never believed that man could be man without his physical body. They were not body conscious like the Greeks were, but the Greeks believed in an independent soul that kind of went off somewhere after death, and the Jews always conceived that man wasn't man without a physical body to live in. And that's exactly what the Bible teaches, and that's exactly what the resurrection shows. Jesus' physical body was placed dead in the tomb, and the Jesus that his disciples and the women met on Easter morning or Easter evening, depending on when he appeared to them, was the same Jesus in a physical body, and yet not at all the same body that they put in the tomb. The only thing that he retained from his time in his physical body was that he still had nail scars and the, the wound in his side. I think as an eternal reminder of the price that he paid for our salvation. And yet, he could come and go in a room through locked doors. The, the, the Bible is very careful to say that the doors were locked 
for fear of the Jews, and by that they mean the Jewish leaders, Jesus appears in the room. And uh, he is walking along with two disciples toward Emmaus. He stops. He has dinner with them. And in the breaking of bread, they recognize him. Now, this is just my opinion, and I'm always careful to say this is my opinion because the scripture doesn't actually say this. I don't know if Jesus physically in the face looked the same as Jesus of Nazareth. And I don't think it matters. But there's this issue of why didn't Mary recognize him when he was standing there at the tomb? Why didn't these disciples recognize him when he walked oh, six miles toward Emmaus with them and didn't recognize him until he sat down to eat and in the breaking of bread, they saw the wounds. And yet there was no denying that it was him. So I don't know if I'm going to look like this in my resurrection body. Hopefully I'm better looking and I won't be overweight, you know? So I don't think it'll matter. I don't know that it'll matter that much, but uh, the resurrection body is a glorified body that is able to do things. Oh, and that was the thing. At the Emmaus gathering, as soon as they recognize him, he's gone. He can come and go as he pleases. And some have speculated, because the Bible doesn't clearly delineate this, that maybe in our resurrection body, we can be on the new earth or we can be in the new heaven, and it's probably not going to take long to get from one place to the other. Some people have speculated that God's got other things for us to do on other worlds in different universes. It's not like we have to get into a spaceship and go there. You know, in the resurrection body, we can, you know, like Dorothy says, People come and go so quickly here. <laughs> but the resurrection body is a body. Jesus, you know, cooked breakfast for the disciples on the shore of Galilee. And uh, I assume that meant that he probably ate. Or he just cooked it for them. Or he cooked it for them. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, but... You know, this, this, there's a place in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, that calls this a dishonorable body, and the resurrection body an honorable body. This one is physical, that one is spiritual. This one is sown in dishonor, and it is raised in honor, in glory. So uh, that's the nature of the resurrection body. We're all going to get one at the second coming. Now this, uh, this verse here in 1 Thessalonians 5, I'm fond of because it shows us the Jewish understanding of the three-part makeup of the human being, where Paul says, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, set you apart, cleanse you, dedicate you to himself, and may, look, your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He said the three parts that make up the human being and he said them in the right order. Spirit is the part of us that God is concerned with the most. The soul, I would say next in line, and he's concerned about our body the least. The it's interesting that they separate the spirit and the soul. I always thought they were one. I always thought the spirit and the soul was one. Mm -hmm. I know, I find it interesting that they... Mm -hmm. 
Here's the thing. You got a dog? Y'all have a dog? Yeah. Does your dog have a body? Yeah. Does your dog have a soul? Well, I thought spirit and soul was yeah. son. Okay, your soul is your ability to think, feel, and choose. Okay, he definitely has that. Yeah. <laughs> Right? Yes. Never mind, I forgot to move the washcloth. <laughs> your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. That's your soul. That's that part of you that thinks, that feels, and chooses. Okay. Every animal has that. Yeah. And every being has that ability. Ha yeah, it has that ability. So, does you know, does your pet have the ability to choose? Of course he does, you know? I'm hungry, I'm not hungry. I, I, I'll obey you, I won't. If he's a dog, he'll obey. If it's a cat, <laughs> probably won't. So, it's a cat. <laughs> but, but, see, but animals have souls, right? Do they have a spiritual dimension that relates them to God? There's no evidence of that anywhere in Scripture. That's exactly right. Does that mean that we don't have the animal heaven? <laughs> there is no evidence of an animal heaven. And that upsets a lot of people. However, I point out that there will also be a new earth. And I can't imagine a new earth with only people right. on it. But maybe not the same animal. I don't know. We can have hope. I'd like to. I'd like to see my boy in 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 the new. Yeah, world, but I'll I don't have, have any guarantees. I'll keep, I'll keep hope. I'll keep my well, hope on that. church we had um we had a woman from the community come in for one of our bible studies for our sunday morning session and you could tell she was just totally lost and one of our older members started a bible study then on thursday mornings basically to help her understand in the book she chose it talked the first chapter was about your soul and everything and how everyone so it was very interesting you know because i had i always thought it was one too yeah. But it's, yeah. I, I do. I find it in there. Yes, it is. Yeah, I'll, and I'll share What's it. the book? It's, it's a, was just a book that our leader had found that talked about for beginners for Christianity. Name, but I have oh, it at okay. home. Oh, okay. I have it at home. Oh, okay. I've kept it. All right. <laughs> so, yeah, and of course, this verse alone is enough to say, well, this is what Paul thought, spirit and soul and body. Distinctiveness. Man has capabilities or capacities. I'm sorry. Man has capacities that go beyond those of any animal and mark him as the pinnacle of God's creation. Man has intellect, emotion, and will. With intellect, he can know, reason, and think. With emotion, he can feel, empathize, and experience. With will, he can choose. Now, we just kind of went over that. These are all characteristics of God. And as such, are part of the image of God within man. In addition, man has the capacity 
to self-awareness, an awareness of God, an awareness of afterlife, the ability to envision life in the future under different scenarios such as heaven and hell. Man certainly has capacities that overlap with the animals, mm -hmm. but his capacities not only go beyond the animals, he has capacities that no animals have. Is that clear? We're the pinnacle of God's creation. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Man was given dominion over creation as the highest form of creation. And finally, this resources that I've been using says that man has an eternal destiny. Man will live forever in heaven or hell. Amen. You are going to live forever somewhere. And you get to choose where. Huh? I thought we came back to live on No, this is you can come back and live on earth if you're saved and uh, you're a citizen of heaven. If you go to fire prepared for the devil and his angels, that's your only option. We always say you are going to live forever somewhere. You don't get to choose what those options are. Those options have been set in place since the foundations of the world. You get to choose whether you go to heaven or whether you go to hell by what you do about the Lord Jesus. If you turn from your sins, put your faith in him, surrender to his lordship and receive the Holy Spirit, then you're saved for eternity. If you reject him, then you're lost for all eternity. And on earth. So, so why do you think God didn't make us all like Jesus? So we were all like him. We yeah. have that will. Huh? We have the will. Well, I know that, but I mean, I mean, he made Jesus to perfect and never sin. Why he, he, didn't he make God? Well, hang on, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. We were made perfect in the beginning. We messed that up. Uncle Adam. Uncle Adam. <laughs> I mean, I know that we have our, he made us and we have our own free will, but isn't that kind of like. Well, uh, let, let me back, let, let me back up for a minute. When you talk about God making Jesus, well, like he, we have to, we have to remember that Jesus is the pre-existent God yeah. and second member of the Trinity who for a short time was given a human body and entered the world the same way we all entered the world. Mm -hmm. He made man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into him the breath of life. He did make Adam perfect without sin. And Adam was the one who chose to go his own way and rebel against God and disobey. That's what I don't understand, why he allowed that. Well, here's the thing. I mean, I know thing. that it's all about free will and all that. I understand that part, but, like, why did he let the devil come down here and torture us? You know? I mean, I know about the free will and all that. I just don't understand. I, I think... I won't I think until I meet him, I guess. I have a little bit of insight into that, and Jesus, I think, had free will, too, because when he went and prayed about his in will. the garden, mm -hmm. you know, he was praying that God could find another way or do it another way, but then in the end, he says, well, let your will be done. That's right. The only way. He also was in the, the, he, the devil.
Well, Well, let me, and I, I agree with you, but let me just clear that up a little bit. Yeah. Because he was God incarnate, and the whole thing about human beings being the fertilized egg in the woman's womb, fertilized by the man, they, the man carries the stain of Adam's sin. Jesus is missing an earthly father. He, you know, a British preacher that I used to listen to years ago used to refer to Jesus being conceived in the borrowed womb of a virgin girl. Just that, you know, borrowed part, you know. But so he isn't born under the stain of Adam's sin. He doesn't have a natural bent toward rebellion like the rest of us do. Now, the Bible was very clear both in the temptation experience that you were talking about. Matthew 4 is my favorite, but he's, he's tempted in Mark and Matthew and Luke, not John. John just didn't tell us that story. But we see the temptation experience of Jesus, which teaches us a lot about how to get past temptation like Jesus did. And Hebrews says that he was tempted in every way the same as we are, yet without sin. He, every being that God has ever created. Now, Jesus existed uncreated eternally in in uh, heaven, but for 33 years became a living human being. But every being that God ever created, whether angels or other mystical beings or every human being who's ever walked the planet, we've all been created with free will. All of us. And that's why angels could rebel, because they had free will. Onto the earth. Onto the earth. So it's not like he allowed him. He just evicted him from heaven is what he did. <laughs> he was evicted. So, so well, this is generating a lot more discussion than I thought it would, and we <laughs> might not even get to the doctrine of sin. But, yeah, uh, but yeah this, is, this is a good thing. Um, man is created as the highest form of, of being on the earth, there is a verse in the Psalms that says, he has made you a little lower than the angels. Which means the angels being ministering spirits, we talked about them last time, were created before us and higher than us. But of the created beings on this planet, we're the highest form of creation that God has made. Oh, yeah, and man will live forever in heaven or hell. Though man's spirit inhabits a body at all times, that body changes after death on earth. A new body is received depending on his destiny in which he will continue to live forever, if you can call an eternity in hell living. But there is no extermination. There is no end to that life. Form. It's just eternal hell. Go back to spirit, soul, and body for a minute. The spirit, that, that, that we don't have the spirit until after we receive Christ. Is that correct? Or is that just a different type of spirit? You're no, sir. About? No, sir. I think that's right <clears throat> for the simple reason that in more than one place, the Apostle Paul says, You were dead mm -hmm. until you were made alive in Christ. And we have this 
wonderful picture at the end of John. And we know that in the Hebrew language and in the Greek language, spirit and wind and breath are all the same word. Ruach in the Hebrew, and it's pneuma in Greek. Pneuma, you know what pneumatic tools are, mm -hmm. right? Or pneumatic tires. Uh, uh, air, air driven. Uh, a pneumatic tool is driven by the power of air, or a pneumatic tire is an inflatable tire. It, ha it just that mm -hmm. the idea of air, mm -hmm. right, is pneuma. But spirit, breath, right, it's all the same word. Now, how did God create the first living being, whom we eventually called Adam, right? forms him out of the dust of the ground, breathes into him the breath of life, and man becomes a living being, or the Bible says a living soul, right? And then in the end of John's gospel, the resurrected Jesus goes to the ten disciples in the upper room. Judas is dead, Thomas is missing, and he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. That's their regeneration. That's their new birth. When they receive the Spirit of God into their life, the same as Adam received the Spirit of God when he was formed in the garden. This is recreation. Hang on, I want to hear you. People need to have God breathe in them twice. First time when they're born, and the second time when the Spirit. Okay. I don't think the first time, though, was God's breath being breathed into us. The first time, we Whatever just air simply is in the room. inhale air. Everyone does. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. So, but the question, I guess, the question I have then is, do we have a spirit between the time we're born or the time of Adam and the time we receive the Holy Spirit, or Christ and Christ gives us the spirit? Do we have a spirit between that time when we're born and we're lost? We're, we're lost. My, I think the Bible clearly teaches that we come into this world with a living physical body and the ability with soulish nature that can, you know, and so on. But we don't have a spiritual nature until we receive the Spirit of God. Oh, well, that's, uh, that's his main task. Well, I, you know, I, actually, I haven't thought this all the way through because people who die without Christ still go on spiritually to live forever. That was my question. What goes so, to hell? Huh? What goes to hell? Yeah. The soul. The soul does, I think. Well, there is... All right. I didn't study this part of it out. <laughs> And I've thought about, about this for a long time. The next week. Well, that's the next question, right? All right. So what's going to happen? You have home. Well, we get baptized with the Holy Spirit, right? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. What about the Holy baby? Spirit is not our a spirit. Baby. I know. What about baby? Baby. 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 Uh -huh. baby? Uh-huh. Baby. 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 resurrection body at the second coming. We don't live on as spirits forever. We live on as spirits inhabiting resurrection bodies. And that includes 
everyone who has ever been born who is in the care of God. Now, there are different theories about that that I'm not going to go into about what really happens and are we waiting for the second coming in, in a sleep or uh, are we in presence of God. Uh, I, tend, I tend toward immediate presence. But I understand both arguments. I have two questions. One is, is it from the minute you're born or from when you're conceived? And two, where in the 66 books we have does it say that a baby goes to heaven? Um, both of those are actually easy. Are what? Good. Or easy. <laughs> Good. In sin did my mother conceive me. So you said from the moment we're born, but I, I've always thought it was from the moment we're conceived. Okay. Everything is preset. Right. Right. Okay, that's why I'm just curious. Okay. That's why the abortion laws. Are right, and that, right. that my question is abortion. Because I've had a lot of people ask me, where, where do those millions of aborted babies go every year? And my answer is, we don't know. I, I don't find anything in the Bible that guarantees me what goes on. But the Bible's not exhaustive of God, as far as I'm concerned, either. It's a handbook. It's not every nitpicking thing that... What about King David? What about David? David, baby. King David, baby died. Yes. That's right. Well, David may have actually been thinking about Sheol, but okay. I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Heaven hadn't been opened up yet at the time David was walking the planet, correct? Well. If you went to Sheol in an Old Testament time before. before Sheol has a dividing. Goal. Yes. Right, you can see hell, and hell can see Sheol. Could. Hades and paradise. Right. It would be nice it's if so God had sent us a book of doctrine and theology with it all lined down. And we have to piece these things together and do the best we can under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Now, God, in his calling of Jeremiah, says... Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Well, first of all, that tells me that none of us are accidents. But it also tells us that God's omniscience is so complete that he knows us before we're ever even conceived. But that little verse in Psalm 51, in sin did my mother conceive me, means from the very moment that I was conceived, I was already a sinner. One of the things that we say is we're not sinners because we've sinned. We sin because we're already sinners. That's our nature. It's our nature. One of my big things is we, we can spend, and theologians can spend millennia debating this stuff, and we're looking at it from a human perspective. We don't have God's That's right. eyes and perspective, is, and we do the best we can. And there are a lot of people who want to call that a cop-out, but we don't have all the answers. Right, not until we get to, 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 I got a lot of questions. <laughs> well, you have a lot of questions now. Now, I know that once not you're mean, in the presence of Christ, yeah. you're not going to care yep. <laughs> the answers uh, to your questions anymore. Um,
they say we won't be envious and we won't be jealous and stuff like that and anymore. I, it, it just, that one is just really confusing. <laughs> you know, and, and you'll have different, I, does it mention about having different crowns or different jewels and having on your crowns or, or something? It has huh? Cast at the feet of Jesus. What? Cast at the feet of Jesus. Well, the the uh, those who surround the uh, throne. There's a wonderful picture in Revelation four and five of worship before the throne of God and the Lamb, and the elders cast their thrones at the foot, uh, cast their crowns at the uh, foot of Jesus' throne. I don't know, I was just listening to some gospel music the other day, and I was listening to Will There Be Any Stars in My Crown, uh, which is an old gospel song about, you know, will there be any stars in my crown when at last all my burdens I lay down. And in the theology of this particular gospel song, the stars that are given to us in our crown are the people that we lead to Christ here on earth. Anyway, that's just, that's not in scripture anywhere. But um, I'm trying to think of the passage that says, by one man sin came into the world. And, and uh, I'm thinking it's Romans. Yep. That's what I was thinking of. That's Romans 5? All right. Fifteen, the free gift is not like the transgression, for if by the transgression of the one, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for on the one hand the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation, but on the other hand the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. For if by the justification of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we're out of time. Let's pray. So we're going to do the second page next week? Yes. Pastor, we asked how it shifts in here. We do ask him to stop and to give you me something to tell us. We can't be here. We can't be here. Why is that? Yes, we asked how it shifts in here. And we need to bring you the food. Don't you want to skip it? No, it's okay. We asked you to bring us to church and a fellowship.
No, no. Well, that was the that was the whole point. You want to meet, or do you want to skip? We want to meet. We want to meet. We'll meet. Yeah. We want to meet. Yeah. That's just because you're not going to be here. You don't get a vote. Yeah, I vote that we go. Yeah, you don't get a vote. <laughs> you're not going to be here. <laughs> okay, no, I don't want right. to be there. <laughs> We're going to pray now. I vote for that. Lord, we thank you for this day and for the opportunity to gather. We pray, Lord, that uh, in our attempt to understand the scripture and make application of it for our lives, that we do all of this to know you better and to please you in all that we say and do. Go with us now into this time of worship, and may we sense your presence and hear your word and respond to it, we pray in obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.